I am Ujjain Bhattacharya, Assistant Professor at Avni and the Convener and Curator of the Avni Lecture Series and Workshops. The Avni Lecture Series and Workshop Committee, Building Voices, Building Alliance, comprises of inquisitive minds which include Dr. Somni Raja, Architect Minakshi Dubey, Architect Devakumarti, Wellness Coordinator Jilna, Architect Afifa Nuzhat and myself who as a team attempt to generate discourse over important concerns of the built and unbuilt environment. Today, we are gathered here for the 2021 edition of the Avni Annual Lecture. Avni invites prominent architects and great minds from across the world to debate, discuss, present their nature of practice and body of work as a part of the Avni Annual Lecture, while offering critical insights on challenges in the built environment. The purpose of this event is not only to offer a set of insights but to also initiate discourse over subject matter that generates ripples across the domains of architecture, its built and unbuilt substances. The whole idea is to engage in a curated conversation to understand the capacities, responsibilities, and consequences of space and ace. I'd now like to invite architect Minakshi Dubey to elaborate on the overarching theme of the event. Hi. Uh, thank you, Jen, and uh, good evening, everyone. In the past two years, the entire world struggled with the ripple effects of the pandemic, which reached every strata of contemporary society, facing numerous challenges of climate uncertainties, ecological imbalances, social strains, psychological turmoil, medical emergencies, political imbroglios, etc., pushing us to rethink our ways of engaging with both built and unbuilt environment. The current academic year at Avni is oriented towards ecologies of adaptations, which unfolded and surfaced earlier this year through our Avni Annual Research Symposium 2021, and further percolated in our academic practice, including studio inquiries as well. We have further our academic inquiries within sub-themes that corroborate with the academic framework, Avni academic framework in respective vision of the studio. For the first year studios, that is reconnection slash re-narrating histories as a theme, while the, sec the studio for the second year revolves around the notion of living and working realities of domesticity. The third year studio engages in critical discourses on magnitude of inequity, inequity and bracing for uncertainties. As we move on to the fourth year studio, collaborations for a resilient future becomes the primary area of inquiry, while penultimate semester we look at vulnerable ecosystems and the resilience as a theme. For the foundation studios in particular, we are looking at the sub-themes that include ecological awareness, sensitivity to environment, and responsibility through the build. With these themes, the studio in integra integrates several subject domains including design, visual arts, design theory, etc., and shall attempt to weave multidisciplinary learnings under a still fabric and allow individuals to rethink, relook, and relearn about our immediates and beyonds. I invite Ujjain to further elaborate on the foundation studio and its key learning areas. Over to you, Ujjain. Thank you, Minakshi. Uh, I'll be elaborating on the foundation studio a little bit. Term reconnections, the studio shall focus on three learning areas to reinforce one's connections with the environment and context. Discovery, discovery of context. As architects, while we decode, deduce, and develop new possibilities of a space, it is absolutely necessary that we converse first with the context. The discovery of the context is an intriguing process. It is slow, and it is that slowness which adds to its indispensable nature. The next key learning area is inquiry, inquiry into material. A critical investigation into the dialogue between material and or of is needed in order to get sensitized to our region's context and respond to the ethics of a place, whether ephemeral or permanent, the nature of material language is very intimate to its context and an inquiry into that makes it possible for us to be informed and aware of its particulars. Finally, coming to the next learning area, engagement, engagement with the built and unbuilt. Lived experiences hold a great degree of significance for humans when they associate themselves with space or at least even the idea of it. These engagements with the built and unbuilt over time result in behavioral developments that are particular to the peculiar grammars of a place when we interact with or within them. With these, we hope to instill awareness, sensitivity, and empathy towards our context as fundamental notions to speculate for a better tomorrow today. Intersecting across these themes of ecology, context, materiality, and region, 
the avni community is pleased and extremely honored to pro welcome professor rahul mehrotra to deliver the keynote address as a part of the avni annual lecture 2021 professor rahul mehrotra is chair of the department of urban planning and design and the john t dunlop professor in housing and urbanization he also serves as the director of the master in architecture in urban design degree program and co-director of the master of landscape architecture in urban design degree program he is a practicing architect urban designer and educator his mumbai and boston based firm rma architects founded in 1990 has completed unsolicited projects driven by the firm's commitment to advocacy of regional and contextual sensitivity one of rma's one of rma architects most celebrated works is a social housing project for 100 elephant and their caretakers in jaipur hathigaon other prominent projects of the firm include a library for the school of architecture at sep faculty of arts and sciences at amdavad university and the school of public policy iim amdavad along with a plethora of socially relevant built works professor mehrotra has written and lectured extensively on issues to do with architecture conservation and urban plan and design in mumbai and india his writings include co-authoring bombay the cities within which covers the city's urban history from the 1600s to the present public places in bombay and bombay to mumbai changing perspectives In 2012 to 2015 he led a Harvard University wide led research project with Professor Diana Eck called the Kumbh Mela mapping the ephemeral mega city his research was extended in the form of a book titled Does Permanence Matter Professor Rotra's research on urbanism is focused on evolving a theoretical framework for designing in conditions of informal growth what he refers to as the kinetic city his most recent book is titled Working in Mumbai and is a reflection of his practice that has evolved through its association with the city of bombay mumbai now i have the honor to invite professor mehrotra to finally deliver the keynote address over to you sir thank you so much my god very kind words thank you uh, very much appreciated um, i wish i was there i see i can feel the energy in that room Uh, I wish people didn't have to wear masks so I could see everyone. But uh, but uh, thank you all for being there. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, I'm going to first just share my screen. That might be a good way to get over all that before. Thank you and uh, thank you all uh, once again. Um, uh, you know it's really nice to be here. Uh, and uh, I wish I was there in person because one could have interacted in different ways. um but uh, anyway i i i think i mean although it hasn't been very frequent one has been part of your conversations when you all were starting out many many years ago and so uh, it's a special occasion to kind of reconnect with the school and with all of you and see all the wonderful things you're doing one of the reasons i kind of uh, i'm glad i called this architecture in context because just listening to the introduction and what you all are doing in the foundational studios makes it so appropriate because um you know you are pretty much uh, i mean i think oh, we are all aligned in the way we think about architecture and the fact that context does matter and i think that is very very important and i think we have to be even more ambitious than asking about the context and i think again in the introduction it was alluded to in terms of you know how does one look at embedded histories how does one complicate the reading of the context that's very critical you know and uh, and so therefore i think we have to be ambitious and even ask what is the context of the context because you know as architects we we of course our pedagogy and uh, different pedagogy has different ambitions and i know you all are among the more ambitious ones but context can be read at in a very kind of simplistic level right it can be read at as the place in terms of its materiality it can be read at in terms of the climate the soil condition the local availability of material the culture and the social life of people and then if we get more ambitious as you are then we look at the embedded histories of a place the layers of histories both tangible and intangible but i think we can even get more ambitious than that and ask the question what is the context of the context and the context of the context then forces us to engage with much broader sort of meta narratives that surround us and these go all the way from climate change uh, uh to issues of justice that are linked to it 
the notion of the urbanization of poverty, uh, what does it mean uh, for a country to become neoliberal in its economic policies? And what are the protocols and processes that come out of that, etc. So that is a more, um, let me say, ambitious, complicated, uh, perhaps even a set of wicked problems or questions that one would be asking, because the answers aren't always clear. Or even if they are clear, they're ever shifting, which means they kind of elude you in a sense. And therefore, the important question here or the important lesson or the input that I'm giving is that when you embed the context you're working in within this more ambitious understanding almost of the planet, that intersection between the questions that you think are very local, very embedded in the site, and these forces uh, that are actually molding what's happening on the planet, at that intersection, at that complicated, blurry intersection, is where the most potent questions lie uh, for us as architects in terms of designing, in terms of formulating uh, what, how we even imagine the problem, how we pick up the problem, how we answer the problem. And I think related to that, is a piece of advice, which is that, you know, every every client has an agenda when they come to you. They have an agenda which could be economic, which could be aspirational, which means it could be about them wanting to create a, a symbol of status or a symbol of goodwill or empathy or whatever. Uh, but they have an agenda. Clearly, others, why would they come to you, correct? Now, the question is, we have to be mindful, articulate, and conscious also of our own agenda. And again, like when the context intersects with its larger context, similarly, when our agendas intersect with those of the client, those become the intersections where the most potent things happen. And, and what do I mean by our agendas? Our agendas could be just the values we bring to it because our training equips us to see the world in a particular way. What does society invest in us? Society invests in us to imagine spatial possibilities so that people could live better lives, right? That's the broadest agenda uh, that society invests in us to fulfill. And so our agenda could be exactly that. Our agenda could be thoughts that we are having in terms of research ideas, uh, ideas that we feel um, you know, could uh, make the clients see something differently, uh, etc. And so it's it's all these intersections that become the potent spaces. Otherwise, you're like a rudderless ship. Someone tells you to do something, you do it. Uh, why are we then investing in you uh, to help society imagine those spatial possibilities, right? So I think uh, I want to just start this lecture uh, by uh, situating the notion of the context, why I call it architecture in, in context, and the importance of the context of the context as an ambition, uh, and the notion of agendas and what that sort of means. And that's just a backdrop. I probably will not revisit this, and I will not, when I show you projects, say, look, this is the agenda we bought, or this is what we, I think you'll be able to begin to see it. And I think for students, I also want to say this at the beginning of the lecture, you know, when I was a student and I would go to, um, uh, you know, lectures, you would kind of almost be overwhelmed that, you know, how did someone manage to pull that off or do a building like this or do a building like that? And how is it being explained? Perhaps so clearly. I mean, that's, of course, for you to judge. But, you know, with retrospect and time and distance, you begin to see the patterns. Yeah, right. Uh, they say in today's world, if you're confused, it just means you're thinking clearly, which means you're thinking. Right. Because the world is a complicated place. Uh, and so so you have to go by your instincts, your values, and then you have to make an effort to retrospectively, whether it's three months, whether it's six months, whether it's one year, or whether for me it's like 30 years of practice, you have to force yourself to retrospectively reflect about what you're doing, because that's what propels you forward. And so this lecture is going to be divided into two parts. The first part, I'm going to share with you all my research interests, which excite me as much as my practice and buildings. And in the second part, I'm going to show you three, four projects uh, and see if we can make some of these connections. What is theory? It's reflecting on what one sees on the ground, which is what I, why I said you must force yourself. You all are agents to produce that theory, which means anyone reflecting uh, and 
actually articulating those reflections helps somebody else, which is what really theory does. Theory creates frameworks that allow or empower or give us agency uh, to act uh, based on varied experiences and insights and perceptions of others, right? And what I'm very impressed with, um, with what you all are doing at Avni is the fact that you're very mindfully thematizing these questions because therein lies the beginnings of trying to create theoretical frameworks. And so therefore, it would be now critical for having taken that direction for you to produce those publications, to reflect on what you're doing, get other people to reflect on what you're doing. And I think one of the other things that I think are important, which I think you all are doing uh, because you're grounded, is theory must be a reflection of the action on the ground. Unfortunately, whether it's you know, at Harvard or whether it's in schools in uh, India, um, uh, elsewhere, and I've been involved with a whole range of places, often we are limited by not updating those theories because, you know, for example, a lot of urban design is informed by the theory that came from the reflections on the ground of the industrializing West in the last century, right? Now the action is in India, it's in China, it's in Africa. We should be having theory and reflections come out of these places. And so for your generation, I mean, I think this is an amazing opportunity and focus on it. However clumsy it might be, however unformed it might be to start with, uh, it will lead to very kind of rich landscapes of thinking. Uh, and I think you all are beginning to do it. I just see the kinds of themes that you all have extracted, uh, you know, all the way from living and working, the realities of domesticity, the magnitude of inequities, embracing for uncertainties, for flux, as I call it, uh, collaborations for a resilient future. I mean, these are all very big themes and within them, of course, come many things. And I hope this lecture will help you define some of that. I start first with the notion of binaries. Uh, you know, binaries are a very useful way for us to organize the world we see around us, right? Uh, the formal city, the informal city, the state and private enterprise, the kacha and the pakka, the rich and the poor, global, local, empowered and marginalized, oral and literary, uh, you know, oral versus literary traditions, etc. So you can make a hundred binaries and it suddenly makes you feel, you know, that you understand the world. And maybe that's true. But how do we go beyond these binaries? How do we blur these binaries? How do we create synthetic moments uh, which are about resolving these binaries? That's what design is about. Design is about synthesis. Design is about taking multiple forces, whether they are requirements from a client, whether they're the budget for the project, whether they're the climate, whether they're the soil condition, the structure. We resolve it into something that's cohesive. So design by nature is synthetic. And therefore, our charge is to resolve, to blur, to go beyond these binaries, not be stuck in these binaries. And that's, I think, a very fundamental question. And it's been an impulse for me right from the beginning of our practice. And that's the reason I call this the kinetic city, the city that we live in in India. Uh, it's not uh, the formal and the informal. I feel, feel those binaries make us become architects who are trying to work in slum with slums and housing rights, or we become architects that work with developers. But can we not be both? Can we not find a way that we resolve that binary, not perpetuate it? The kinetic city is a very particular condition. Uh, it's a condition that often lacks the meta narrative or the broader framework and armature. And it's about only incremental moves. And that may be not a nice thing, uh, but it's something we have to recognize, which is, you know, 90% of the economy in India is informal. These are what I call the five stages of squatting. This guy's in the third stage of squatting. By the time the monsoon comes, he puts a canopy and then, you know, fortifies himself and he becomes part of the landscape. There's a clear logic here. And the logic is related to the index of security, right? So, and the typologies come from that. And so basically, uh, I think um, one has to find ways of infecting the broader discourse of planning and urban design with these sorts of readings, but doing them systematically, not fetishizing these, not making them nostalgic, but trying to draw what we see in our own cities 
within the discourse, the language uh, of architecture and planning. And that is the responsibility we have. It's very easy to write about all of this as a do-gooder, you know, as Florence Nightingale touching the hearts of the poor and all of that. But that's not enough. Th those are gestures. We have to find ways that we can bring this into the discourse of planning. And really, it is about challenging the idea uh, of the city as a static and stable entity. Uh, there's uncertainty, there's flux. And I think with climate change, uh, this idea of the kinetic city of ephemeral, reversible, will help us facilitate transitions. And now, this is a lecture in itself, which I'll be happy to do at some point for you all. I did it last morning. I did it for someone in China, which is how can one look at the ephemeral, the reversible in, in terms of making the transitions for climate change? So the kinetic city is about appropriation, about incrementalism, about elasticity. Uh, and of course, we also need certainty, right? Um, so while we... Okay, so I was saying the attributes of the kinetic city uh, are uh, appropriation of space about incremental elasticity. Now, you also need certainty. So the armature of... Uh, I mean, the urban design could provide or planning could provide that armature within which this happens. But often we work counter to this because we either deem this illegal uh, or inappropriate, not about appropriation, uh, or want end results, not incrementalism, want absolute solutions. Uh, you know, I mean, look at the kinds of projects that are happening even in India today. It's all about absolutism. We don't want elasticity. We want, we are obsessed with stability. Uh, and so therefore the question becomes, how does one make these balances? Uh, because it's really not about one or the other. It's about both existing. And what does appropriation mean? I mean, for example, the street in Mumbai, you know, during the Ganpati festival, it becomes a community hall, which can house 200 people. They have movies there. And in, after 10 days, it goes back to the ordinary street. And so this is really the kind of uh, elasticity, appropriation of space, reappropriation. And, you know, this is not just the poor. It's the middle class. It's the rich. Because we often sort of attribute this just to the poor, right? I mean, big weddings happen like this among the super rich. So here, architecture is not even what I call the spectacle of the city. Uh, here, other aspects like festivals become the spectacles of the city. And here, when this clay idol from which the statue of, of Ganesh is made dissolves in the water on the last 10 days, there is no memory of the city. Uh, it's an enacted process. It's ephemeral, right? Uh, and it's very different from where we make architecture the central spectacle of the city. Uh, this is very brittle form. I call this the architecture of impatient capital. Capital is intrinsically impatient. It must realize its value very quickly. And the sites around the world that make that realization of value frictionless become the cities of impatient capital, like Dubai's and Singapore's and Shanghai's, because they allow capital to realize its value unfrettered. But it's not people-centric. These are brittle forms. I mean, how will you even maintain these buildings in another 50 years? I mean, this is huge resources being locked into what has no kind of perspective really on time. Whereas in the kinetic city, you have these two coexist. Now, even this, and that's why I can't call this the formal and the informal city, because formality and informality comes out of economics also as a category. And if you look at this image, you know, you realize that people we think are living in the informal city are actually part of the formal economy. They work as government employees, they work for the railways, they work in hospitals and hotels and all of that. They also work as domestic help in these apartments. And, you know, as you all know, a lot of people living in these fancy buildings are perhaps partaking also in the informal economy. So what the formal city does is in the informal economy also. So there's a blur here. And therefore, making the binaries doesn't really help us. I will come back to this image later in a project. But here I want to you know, argue using um, uh, Martha Chen. She's a professor of economics at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And she works on the, and she's perhaps the world's authority on the informal economy. And I, I'm quoting something she wrote on economics, but it resonated very deeply with me uh, in terms of being an architect. And what she said, and I'm quoting her now, is 
what is needed most fundamentally is a new economic paradigm, a model of a hybrid economy that embraces the traditional and the modern, the small scale and the big scale, the informal and the formal. What is needed is an economic model that allows the smallest units and the least powerful workers to operate alongside the largest units and the most powerful economic players. And, you know, this sort of forms of coexistence, I believe, architecture has a huge, huge, huge role to play. And I think this is what we should aspire to. And this is where I think for a lot of you, for all, all of us as architects, how do we make our spheres of concern uh, in, intersect with our spheres of influence? So how do we calibrate them that they come close? Right now, our spheres of concern are completely disproportionate uh, with our spheres of influence. Our spheres of concern grow every day. As you have coffee with friends, when you talk about justice and social justice and inequity and uh, you know climate change and all the problems around the world, including politics, your spheres of concern are expanding. But on the same time, your sphere of influence is actually diminishing because I'm sure you wake up in the morning and say, now what am I going to do? What, how big should that extension I'm doing to my auntie's house be? You know, your influence comes down to something as small as that. And so the question is, how do we do this expansion? And this is related to what I introduced the lecture with, which is our concerns of the context, of the context, our concerns with more mindfully evolving historical and theoretical frameworks about our understanding of a place, etc. And so here research becomes very important. And for us, the research has not been driven by the practice, but by concerns and actually drives the practice, which is to say, often, you know, um, we get a project, let's say you get a project for a airport or you get a project for some form of infrastructure, let's say a community center or a crash for children in a village or whatever it might be. And then you say, let me research what these crashes should be and let me research, uh, you know, precedents and things like that. And of course, that's very important. But I'm saying our research concerns must go beyond that. They must not be they might, must not be only in service of our projects, but they must be ones that help us formulate projects, help us think about the world, help us understand the context of the context, right? And so that expansive uh, uh, approach is, I think, a very important one. And so, you know, for me, now I'm going to just show you projects and tell you my personal story. My first sort of engagement with this was for Mumbai, where I wrote a number of books with a friend, Sharda Devedi. I did some on my own. These range from, you know, Bombay, the cities within, which looked at the mega history, kind of meta history of Mumbai from the 1600s to the present. But they were also books which were like walking tours of the port area, which created a lot of awareness about these historic districts. Uh, the book you see next to the Fort Walks is a book where we said, okay, we had legislation in Mumbai, let's reflect about it. And we had a conference, we organized it, and then we put all the thoughts that people had about whether it's important to have conservation legislation in a book called, you know, uh, it was called Conservation Con Conversations, looking at conservation and what it has done in Mumbai, etc. Now, of course, a lot of this writing led to things. In Mumbai, we managed um, to lobby with the government uh, through these workshops and things. And this is all in 92, 93, um, where we managed to then convince the government to have a heritage regulation. And this became the first heritage regulation in the country in 1995, which covered a large historic district uh, and 600 odd buildings. Uh, and so it basically shifted the conversation on conversation on conservation from individual buildings to also looking at historic districts. Uh, and this, of course, led then to the fort area. And, you know, we found that after we did the legislation for a few years, nothing happened. So then we began to work as advocates. We began to find that within the fort district in Mumbai, there were very particular qualities of certain areas. Right. I mean, there were some areas where, like what you see in yellow here, where we found uh, that banks were concentrated. So we said, what if you made it a banking district and how do we imagine a banking district? And, you know, what is in red is a tourist district, et cetera. Um, and uh, and then what you see in kind of pink purple is the art district, which uh, where we found a lot of galleries, which is the Kalagoda area. Some of you might know it. 
And we began to ask the question, what is the contemporary engine that would drive the process of conservation? Because conservation can't be just about nostalgia, you know, and I think in places like Cochin and others, uh, you know, art has sort of driven it, which is where this was the beginning of that uh, as a transforming agent, even for the built environment. And this was all in 95 when we began to 96, when we began to look at this and we said, and I mean, again, this is a whole lecture in itself because I can tell you the story of each district, which is very different because it involved different constituencies and people. But the art district where there were a number of galleries, there was a museum, there's a National Gallery of Modern Art, we felt could be a good starting point. And of course, this led to the creative creation of the Kalagora Association. It led to the Kalagora Festival. I'm not going to talk about all of that, but that was what started transforming the areas in terms of conservation because people began to you know, recycle buildings for galleries, things that are now happening because of the Biennale in Cochin and things. Uh, so that became the driving agent. In the yellow area, the banks became a driving agent. And in, we thought in the red area, tourism would be, but that didn't go very far for many reasons, uh, et cetera. So these are, again, stories which you know are a whole lecture. But the point I want to make here uh, is twofold. One is that in conservation, we have to also look at the future. The architect must also be an agent of change, not one who only opposes change. And I think that is a wonderful challenge because you walk a very thin line. You walk a line between creating the illusion and, and conserving the illusion of the architecture as a container, but actually recycling its use, draining it of its ideological content and opening up new possibilities. So this balance of keeping the continuity of the building fabric, but imagining a whole generation that would have other aspirations is important because culture, identity, these are not static uh, categories. These are ever evolving. We construct our identity by the values we relate to, by the things we want to do, by the sorts of things we want to support, etc. And so the architect's role as an agent of change in facilitating the construction of significance is as important as safeguarding the significance. And this is, again, a kind of point of intersection between the context, which might be a historic context, but its context, which might be shifting um, uh, aspirations for people, right? And in post-colonial conditions like ours, or where, you know, where the creators of that environment, with the, whether it was the Dutch or whether it was the British, are a completely different cultures from us, who are now the custodians of that environment, right? And so therefore, these are the kinds of intersections that are meant by the context of the context, because at those intersections, it opens up all sorts of possibilities. So that was one thing I wanted to flag out. I'm not going to go and show you these projects. The second thing I wanted to say was that, again, this is not a binary in the sense that uh, conserving historic areas, conserving buildings is as much part of our practice of creating new, because we learn a lot from conservation. We learn a lot in terms of material life cycles. We learn a lot about how buildings are made, but also they become opportunities to think about new imaginations within historic districts. And so in the Kalagoda area, we did many things from signage to organizing the festival to raise money and start restoring many of the gallery spaces. Many new galleries came there, et cetera, and it became an art district of sorts. But we also, with the museum, talked about the contemporary interventions. And this was very difficult because here's the museum in the Kalagoda area. You know, they needed a visitor center. They had a warehouse which wasn't being used. So we recycled the warehouse. We added around, uh, wrapped around an existing building, a very contemporary kind of thing, uh, uh, structure, but all with the intent that these were reversible, which means that they were done in ways that any, the next generation could reverse them very easily without damaging the integrity of the fabric if that generation felt it should be done differently. And of course, because it was a museum, Indo-Sarsenic Indo building, everyone wanted us to do this in you know, stone that matches the stone of the building and et cetera. But we decided to actually create a counterpoint, which was very respectful in terms of scale, but it was also very reversible. And so the visitor center really became this big stainless steel canopy. And this is, I mean, this was designed in, you know, 2001 or two, 
where uh, even you know materials like this were not so easily available i think i think the design was done in 98 uh, and it was sort of built finally by 2011 uh, and you know it became a kind of gateway uh, to the museum but in a kind of very contemporary way so so this is like how i'm just trying to show you how from questions you ask in research in my case it was with my wanting to understand Mumbai, but also as an agent who could transform things in Mumbai, led to legislation, but it also led to buildings, which uh, <clears throat> many of these were self-initiated projects in that there wasn't a project, but in doing a master plan for conservation for the museum, many things emerged as being deficiencies in the system. And therefore we said, could we not do this and that? And th those discussions actually led to projects. So. So that was one trajectory. The other trajectory for research for me has been, uh, you know, books on architecture, because that, of course, is one something one enjoys immensely. And the first book you see here, World Architecture, was done with Kenneth Frampton, who is a critic and uh, teaches at Columbia University. And he was doing 10 volumes to cover 100 years, 1900 to 2000 around the globe. And he asked us to do South Asia. Uh, and it was a wonderful experience, which then led me to doing a book called Architecture in India since 1990, which some of you might know or not know. This came out in 2010. But then also, how does one take this research and give it traction? How does one make it more part of the public imagination. I think that becomes very important. And so what we did was this exhibition called the State of Architecture Practices and Processes in India, uh, which looked at architecture since India's independence. And, you know, it had, you know, many sort of data sets. It had publications on architecture in India since 1947. Uh, you know, it mapped what you see in these columns is very interesting. What you see in these columns here are the schools of architecture. You guys are in this lot, which went from like about three or four schools since independence to 426 or whatever the number is, schools. And there was a great explosion. And, you know, I'm saying this very carefully because I don't mean this as discouragement, but what I mean is you have to imagine new ways. So if you look at this graph here, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. So if you see this graph here, uh, and you see you see how the schools are increasing in numbers, right? It is an explosion. But what you see here is a blue graph, a blue line, which you can see very faintly. I'm moving my cursor along it. And that blue line takes you to 1992 around here and 2000 around here. And that is when we liberalized our economy. And this is where real estate became a kind of recognized framework, right? And you had massive investments in housing. So real estate values and real estate construction went up like that, right? It went up like very sharply. And if you see the schools of architecture start growing in relation to the way that graph goes up. And, you know, my own theory, and that's why I'm saying this very carefully, because it's not a discouragement, but actually an encouragement, which is that, you know, when you drive around, as you guys must have been teenagers, your parents, everyone thinks, oh, my God, there's so much construction. So architecture will be a good field to go into for my child, you know. And now that is completely uh, counterintuitive. And I'll tell you why. Because when real estate gets organized, essentially what happens is one developer starts building these gated communities and housing a thousand families, right? Uh, that developer hires, has probably an architect in-house. Some of them are more ambitious and for their prestigious projects will go to an architect. But in any case, one architect lands up doing, you know, uh, in one shot homes for a thousand families, right? In the older model, if you actually had, say, town planning and you had a, a scheme where plots were made and people were allowed to build their own houses in a low rise, high density situation, then the thousand families, even if 10 families went to one architect, you'd have a hundred architects uh, employed, right? So actually uh, the growth of real estate in, as an organized sector is, is, dispropor is inversely proportionate to the demand for architecture, but yet the schools of architecture are going up. So that's completely a bizarre sort of condition, right? So we are all going to be actually unemployed because <laughs> there's not going to be so much work. That is the truth in the conventional sense. And here's 
why I think it becomes an encouragement for you, not a discouragement. And that's why I'm taking the effort to frame this talk in this way, is we have to find how we can operate in society by making ourselves useful to help society organize spatial possibilities. So we have to look, we shouldn't all gravitate to what we see the real estate uh, sector doing, because there's a lot more to be done. And I think you're all finding the spaces where you need to act is the critical uh, question. We extended this exhibition in an exhibition which focused just on the state of housing, because I felt housing is where the architects are beginning to get completely marginalized. Uh, and of course, this has led to catalogs and a lot of documentation. I hope it's in your library. If it's not, you should let me know. I'd be happy to help you. Uh, we documented you know, 70 cases, which you see in those racks. We also had films on housing. Uh, we created a you know, mock-up of a 400 square foot house, which is what the government metric is, 350 or whatever. And we created all these sorts of catalogs, etc. So that was sort of one trajectory of architecture, which sort of took me to housing. And then in urbanism, uh, the Kinetic City actually then became this project, which is looking at the Kum Mela, uh, which I call mapping the ephemeral megacity. This was an interdisciplinary project that involved a lot of people. And again, I don't have the time to go into the details. These are lectures. You'll find it on YouTube. You go to the TED Talks. I've done a TED Talk. So please look at that. I don't want to use up this space. But you know, the Kum Mela, you know, happens at the confluence of the Ganges and the Yamuna in a matter of six weeks when the sand is exposed after the monsoon and the water retracts. A city of 7 million people is built for 55 days. Now, that's a before and after image I took uh, from the same spot. I mean, the bottom one was by a professional photographer. The top one, I think I had taken. And the tree you see here is the same tree. Uh, and you see in a matter of six weeks, once the water recedes, you have a whole city that appears. It's a city on a grid. It's incredibly robust. Uh, and totally reversible, no foundations, very light. It's the kind of lightest a mega city in the world. Uh, it's made out of five materials, which are all uh, reversible. Uh, and these scale up in typologies in an incredibly fascinating way. But when it gets dismantled, all that is left are the thatch mats on which people slept. And when the water comes in the monsoon, the memory of the city is erased. And all you see are some streets. So this sort of reversibility, this sort of ephemerality, uh, and the notion that this is not a pop-up city, uh, people call it a pop-up city. People, uh, you know, but it's actually a formal, deliberate state enterprise. The UP government pays for it. It's mind blowing. So this this idea that when we look at something that's temporary and it becomes informal and it becomes a category is a complete misnomer, and we have to challenge it because then we can effectively use these within the discourses of planning and urban design and architecture. So this work then we took as an exhibition to the Venice Biennale. And I felt where architecture and where architects are all showing off their work, uh, which is all about permanence, it would be great to have a, a, a installation on the ephemeral. And we called it Does Permanent Matter? And the whole installation was made in bamboo and cloth. And the, all the cloth that you see in these images all fitted in two suitcases. So it was a very kind of lightly touched exhibition uh, without trying to create a big footprint of you know materials and all of that. And this led to a project which was called Ephemeral Urbanism, Does Permanence Matter? And the idea here was to ask the question about how we can, within the discourse of planning, bring questions of the ephemeral, which is to say, how, does, how do we bring the imagination of time in the way we think about architecture? And so this has now led to a bigger project, which is called What is Urban? looking at urbanism in India and looking at what does urban even mean in India. Uh, and the proxy here of the night lights tell you it's not so clear what are the cities and what is the hinterland, uh, because it also becomes a blur. And this is a book which I think will take three, four more months. The pandemic put it back, which I did with a former student, or I am doing with a former student and now a very well-known practitioner himself, uh, sort of Bishwas. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully this will be out soon and happy to talk about it. The present Venice Biennale, which just came down, has an installation uh, on this work. We also put together our research, and this I think might be relevant for Avani because of what you all are all doing with the thematized studios. It's very important to capture it. Uh, and so what we do is I work with the rubric called extreme urbanism. So I take the most difficult problems 
uh, which are wicked problems, and we try to do studios around them, asking questions in this case of hyperdensity or what does it mean to plan for conservation where we took Agra. We didn't take the Taj Mahal, but we took the city of Agra and said, what surrounds the Taj Mahal, for example? Uh, and then these become very useful documents. And again, if you all don't have these in the library, let me know. I'd be happy to send you a box full of all these publications. And the new one, which will be released in two weeks, is called Sanitation as Infrastructure. We've just looked at mapping the Swachh Bharat mission, what it has achieved, what it means. And then we've taken a site in Mumbai and Mahi, and we've tried to see how one could intervene there with sanitation uh, infrastructure. So therefore, you know, the research is very much part of the practice. Uh, and, um, you know, you can see here the typologies I just showed you, which is things on Mumbai, which led to the legislation and to discussion about conservation and then led us to expand it to the Taj Mahal uh, uh, book and project. This was all on urbanism and housing and architecture. And these are the two recent books. Uh, this is called The Kinetic City and Other Essays, which where I've compiled uh, 30 years of uh, writing through 21 essays, which I believe represent my writing. And this is called Working in Mumbai, which looks at our practice over 30 years. So this has buildings and that has words, but they actually are very connected. But I want to say that for me, these are instruments of advocacy. Some of these books are scholarly. Some of these books are uh, advocacy documents. Some of them are documentation. Some of them are studio recaptures and reflections. I call them instruments of advocacy. And this is where going back to what should a generation do? What are the new ways that you can think about practice? You know, we all feel that we should be making the instruments of advocacy, which means we should be documenting an old historic building, and then we should become the advocates because we own that material. We become very possessive of that. I think that's a mistake in today's world where we need to look for collaborations. And therefore, I think we are very well trained to make instruments of advocacy, which means we are fantastic at documenting a historic building, of telling uh, in a report what needs to be done, of estimating it. But we need to then partner with people, whether they are foundations, whether they are NGOs, whether they are you know, civil society more broadly to make this happen. So we shouldn't get very possessive. If we start thinking about these as instruments of advocacy, they have their own life afterwards. We have to let these babies go. Uh, we can't do all of that. And that way we create other ways we can be useful, I believe, to society. And here, I think we often talk about the practice of architecture. What we need to do is think about the architecture of practice, which is what is the framework within which you want to practice? How do you want your research, your your engagement in the construction or making of instruments of advocacy or teaching or advocacy itself also. It's not that we can't do that, but you have to think about the frame. You have to think about what is the broader architecture of practice, not get obsessed just with the practice of architecture. And, and that leads me to my last um, uh, set of observations. I'm sorry, I'm sort of loading this with theoretical frames and ideas and questions, but I want to just share this observation and then I'm going to very quickly show you uh, three or four projects and you know uh, we'll end. Uh, so the other thing that I've come to sort of think about uh, in retrospect, looking at 30 years of practice uh, and uh, is the way we look at the client, you know, we take the client as a single entity and that often happens in a single family house uh, or, um, you know, in a weekend house where the maximum tension you have to deal with is a couple who might have differences. But otherwise, every client is really contains a patron client, an operational client, and a user client, right? Uh, a patron client is, so, so in a weekend home or in a house, these all collapse into one entity. But like, let's say, a campus, or let's say, a government project, or let's say what we did in Hatigaon, which I'm going to show you. The patron client is the one who has the money, who commissions the project, often has very clear articulation of their aspirations, why they're doing the project, etc. The operational client, so in the case of a government project, that would be the chief minister or the municipal commissioner or you know whoever. The operational client is the public works department, the municipal engineers, the campus architect or campus engineer, etc. Right? They're the ones who make it happen. And then the third is the user. 
uh, in a campus, it would be students and faculty. In you know housing projects, it would be people who occupy. Now, in a lot of projects, these three parts of the client actually have very little communication with each other. We as architects, by default, land up aligning with one of these. Either we become the champions of the user, and then we are fighting with the operational client and the patron client, or we get appointed by the chief minister or the president of the university, and we become like hot shots because everyone seems to listen to us, etc. But really, the architect's role is bringing these three sets of very different aspirations at the same table and becoming the bridge that connects an understanding of those disparate aspirations, which is all the way from understanding budgets and what budgets can do and not do, to how space uses, how space is used by the users, and how those feedback loops are completed. The notion of feedback loops is very critical. And so therefore, to imagine ourselves as bridges, as bridges in society, bridges between the rich and the poor, bridges between the state and the private, really is where you begin to blur the binaries that I was talking about. And so this understanding of the client is very critical. I'm kind of bringing it closer to projects because these are now all operational things. So the three projects I'm going to show you after I take a breath uh, and have a sip of my coffee is uh, I'm going to show you a project where it was clients that were corporate. I'm going to show you a project where they were institutional clients and one that they were government clients. And what you should keep in mind is in this, from the corporate, these three clients are a little closer to each other. In the institutional, they begin to break apart a little bit. And in the government, they get fractured completely. And so the challenges of bringing them together are quite different. I'm not going to talk about it, but keep that implicitly at the back of your mind. So the first project I'm going to show you is in Hyderabad. It's a corporate building for a firm called KMC, uh, which is an infrastructure company. And you know the climate of Hyderabad. Now, we were given a site which is in Cyberabad. Uh, and uh, these are all essentially glass boxes. This is designed by Mario Botta, and it's clad in brick, so with a sliver for light, uh, which is quite a sensible building. But the rest are just glass boxes, essentially. And we were given a site here. Of course, now the whole site is filled up. This is a very old Google image. I realized in Hyderabad those days, because of the Telangana issue, People were stoning buildings, there were riots and things like that. And so when the curtain glazing guys sold you a material, this is not our building, by the way, sold you material for cladding, they also gave you options of fishing nets and details to fix fishing nets so people couldn't destroy the glass. And it made me think, my God, how bizarre is this that these images of impatient capital, of global architecture, of glass and steel as being modern, is so compelling that people go to putting fishing nets on top of it to protect it because the image is so sacred. And that's kind of bizarre. We were inspired by this wonderful little hut, which in Jaipur, a business community uh, and the government in collaboration put up. There are about 100 such huts put up. That guy works for them. And it's a water cooler. He puts his kettle out uh, and he serves water to anyone in the heat because it gets very hot in Jaipur. And there's no plastic glasses. It's a wonderful gesture. They cup their hand, they wipe their hand with a little water to keep make it clean, and then drink the water. Uh, he comes out once in a while and keeps the hut humid. So through evaporative cooling, the hut stays very cool because he's in the hut. Uh, and it's this thatch kind of material. And within the hut, the water is kept in earthen pots, which also are slightly porous. And earthen pots, as you know, matkas, through evaporative cooling is what they keep cool. So it's a very beautiful gesture. And, you know, we studied it as part of research, which had nothing to do with the building. But we just thought, wow, what a wonderful use of architecture. And we had been documenting it through videos when we were going to Jaipur. And this has all been done by people in the office. It's not professional at all. And we, we were very inspired by this. So the building we came up with was a screen, which is a five-foot-high garden, uh, but it has a hydroponic tray and a, a misting system embedded in it. So it's not, it's not a green wall in the way you put all these plastic pots on the wall and make a kind of sculpture out of it, but it's actually a performative screen. So it works very much like what we saw in that thatch or how cuss was put in Delhi and things uh, for cooling the air and you through humidification, essentially. And then it allowed us to create every facade difference. So in Aleko Bond, one would have made patterns like this. 
uh, but instead we did it with different plants and that was on a trellis and then behind the trellis was a hydroponic tray and then different species could be grown which we tested in the lab uh, for the sun south north uh, and you know it impatient capital the corporation wanted to uh, have the building very quickly so they gave us 14 or 15 months but we managed to convince them that we will take uh, two years to grow the facade and we made the facade using recycled aluminum alloys in a small factory outside Hyderabad uh, and it was all handmade with 20 workers very slow process because the mold was expensive so we only invested in one mold but the clients were of course impatient the cows came the pujaris came the puja happened all that and they started using the building while the facade grew so by detaching the facade from the impatience of the use of the building one could actually uh, do something like this and that's what the facade looked like when it was finished a trellis crafted and all handcrafted and aluminium uh, with the hydroponic trays and then you know it grows becomes a woolly monster you give it a haircut and the facade sort of changes so it's a dynamic facade in some ways and there you see the misting coming from it the misting is mainly to cool the building uh, the plants work on the hydroponic trays uh, that are in uh, you know with are embedded in the facade it also has a podium which becomes a social place uh, it also has um, a, a, a set of courtyards and atriums. What you see in the center is the tenders and the billing and the accounts. So they need privacy. The rest are designed around atriums. So this is an auditorium, a gym, and a cafe on the top, which is social space. And here is the corporate office with all the different requirements, conference rooms, and you know all of that. And it becomes that's lemon grass that hopefully keeps the mosquitoes away. Uh, but you see, you see the flowers, and you know every facade is quite different. And then with Within it, the atrium allows connections between different departments. It's more sculptural. Uh, and also, the top allows the hot air to escape. Of course, we didn't get a LEED certificate in those days. Greha didn't exist. Uh, and you know the building next to us, our neighbor got a LEED certificate, which is very bizarre, because that's a dumb glass box with very heavy sealants and air conditioning. Uh, and ours was much more passive in that sense, etc. And then one realized that even this whole debate about sustainability needs to be localized. It needs to be articulated in our own terms. Otherwise, what happens is we make the stupidest buildings and then there's a green industry that comes with a mechanical or a chemical fix uh, to get us the platinum certificate. So it's all a bit bizarre and you should be very cynical about all of that. The plants allow ornament. Uh, because the shadows are changing and that becomes really the ornament in the office. And I come back to this image, which uh, in turn from Panama City, who happened to come to Mumbai to work with us and visited the site, took and it's a beautiful image. And, you know, it's interesting. And this is, uh, I think, for me, in retrospect, the greatest learning from this building is those hydroponic trays became a catwalk. And therefore, the gardeners, there are 20 of them, uh, can walk anywhere in the corporation to do their work. They can look into the glass and make eye contact with their bosses. There are blinds everywhere, but no one puts the blinds down. And they become the most powerful workers. I mean, the question is, would this woman have worn that sari to work if she didn't feel the you know, consciousness of being in almost a public domain within the factory. So Sanjay Prakash, who you might know of, who's an architect in Delhi, works on sustainability and is a friend. And he came to see the building and looked at images. And he said, you know, the thing is, you've created green jobs because what you've done is made the least powerful workers actually become powerful in that the identity of the building depends on their skill because the facade is what they do. And therefore, there is, um, uh, there's dignity in that. Uh, and there's empathy that grows out of that. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. People have made friends. The gardeners have become very popular. They remember people's birthdays and give them a bouquet of flowers. They catch a butterfly for someone's daughter who has to take a school experiment, etc. And so there are many stories like that, which for me were very wonderful and touching. And in terms of trying to reflect on it, one realized that what one had done by default, not consciously, by default, is created a soft threshold. Thresholds in society, we perpetuate them, uh, actually separate people in society because they make an inside and an outside, a public and a private. So if you can broaden, thicken, soften, make more porous your thresholds, 
in the way you design, whether sometimes it's just visual transgression uh, that is important, that becomes the beginning of empathy through the recognition of the other, in a sense. And this is all about coming back now to the notion of blurring binaries and coming back to what we can learn from the kinetic city. It's these sorts of lessons that we should uh, we should extract from what we see around us not fetishize what we see around us and not even make separate what we see around us but find ways in our imagination to bring it together through this sort of porosity this is an image that wasn't staged if it was going to be staged i would have removed the newspaper removed all the wires i just happened to walk in to see this guy and i saw the gardeners working at the back and just took this image spontaneously. And so those are the heroes of the building, the people who keep the identity of this building intact. And there was a public garden next to the building which the clients sponsored. And so now actually in terms of an illusion, you feel the building is coming kind of out of the garden, which was uh, an interesting uh, sort of end result, not again designed or intended. The next project, which is institutional, is SEPT University, the School of Architecture, you know, the original buildings designed by Doshi. And we were asked to uh, do a library and I studied there. So it was a big honor, but it was also intimidating because it was going to be the first building that was going to be a non-Doshi building. And so there was a lot of, you know, you know, angst and controversy and some people supported it, some people didn't. But anyway, I was asked by another generation now running the school to do, and they gave us a site, Christopher Benninger did the master plan and we had no choice on the site. And we were given the site for the library, the brief call for a six story building, uh, you know, which we were very uncomfortable doing. We had, again, this is where I began to see the connection between the patron client, the operational client and the user client. And having been a student there, I kind of had the comfort to go between all three. Uh, and so we did many presentations. So here you see we're presenting to faculty and students getting feedback at every stage of the project. So it was a completely different process uh, because here the kind of client was quite different. And essentially what we came up with was a building that was like an intervention in a historic district because we felt I mean, not only having been a student there, but the beautiful buildings designed by Doshi, we felt we should not we should respect every datum. We should not go above any building. And so our datums were established based on Doshi's buildings, which meant to accommodate the program, we had to go kind of um, uh, three floors below the ground. So it became a building which kind of went below the ground. And I mean, you know, people often look at it and say, oh, uh, yes, the step 12s must have uh, inspired you. And I say, look, the honest truth is no. It basically, we were inspired by the fact that we were making an intervention in a what we call a historic modern district and uh, or a, a, a district of, you know, historic value uh, as a kind of piece of modern architecture, and therefore we wanted to respect it. And of course, having made that decision, it opened up a lot of possibilities. So we saw it as creating a large courtyard in which the building sat, uh, not just making it a basement uh, in the classical uh, kind of way. And essentially what we came up with was a series of, it's like Chinese dolls nestled in each other, uh, a, a big pit where you have three buildings. One is a building which is a two-story building, which is a facade that modulates the climate. And then you have an inner building, uh, which is what contains the reading rooms and facilities like that. And then within that, you have a building, which is the carols, uh, the book carols. And each of these have their own logic, which means uh, uh, sectional logic. So the outer building is 4.5 meters. The inner building is 3.6 meters. And the inside building is 2.4 meters because 2.4 meters is eight feet. And that's a maximum even on a low stool that anyone can reach a book, uh, et cetera. So that comes from not only the functional and the operational, but it also comes from the idea that if you had three nestled buildings, uh, it was underground, not a basement, but within a courtyard, and you had a slippage in section, then your vistas become very elongated because you can actually see great distances on the diagonal rather than feel trapped like you're in a sandwich. And that was really the, the determining factor. And so that's what the model looks like. You see the outer building, you see the next building, and within it, you see the carols and things which are the bookcases. So on the facade, when you come out, you see a very low key building. You can see parts of the Doshi building, the data 
datums are maintained. Uh, it's interpreted differently. The base is a very thickened base where people can sit and occupy it. And then the facade is a movable and adjustable set of louvers. And in white, you see the inner building, uh, which is the building that sits within it. And these louvers can be adjusted depending on the climate. Uh, and here you see how it relates to the datums of the existing buildings, but it has its own presence. And we created a plinth and a base for it. We tied all the other buildings to create a plaza. Uh, and here you see again the differentiation between the buildings. Uh, you see how we responded to the historic buildings that designed by Doshi. Uh, and you see it's a series of buildings that you enter, and then that becomes a courtyard. And that changes also the vocabulary in terms of how you experience it. And then you see the courtyards. It has skylights which take the light uh, down to uh, the lower levels. Uh, and, and also in terms of construction, the outer facade is concrete and very light steel and plywood on the top. And the inner is gypsum board. It's all dry construction. It's steel. And so once the outer wet construction was done, the inside was just steel, which could be fabricated very uh, quickly. The ground floor is a very ambiguous space. It's meant for duties and discussions, but it now gets used for exhibitions because they don't have exhibition spaces. I wish it would go back to this ambiguous use because that ambiguity of coming in and out of the building and the spaces and the functions is very important. When you go to the upper, when you go to the lower levels, I'm going to take you now down here, then I'll take you up there. You see the concrete starts getting whiter as it goes underground, so it reflects more light. You see the carrels in there, which is the building within the building. And here you see the carrels, you see the courtyard outside. If you want to talk to friends, you go to the courtyard outside so you don't disturb the library. Within the carrels, all the services are fitted, so the ceilings are very clean. There are no ducts and things because it's minimally air conditioned. I mean, there's an air conditioning system, but it needs to be used minimally because uh, the the geothermal qualities of being sort of underground. And this is what I meant by you see the views on the diagonal. So from anywhere, you always get a hint of the natural light um, because you see across. And where you see people reading at the bottom is now nine meters below the ground. But you see the courtyard at 4.5 meters, which is the first courtyard, which also brings light down there. Uh, through these skylights. And it's very austere. It's just these three portals in exposed concrete. All the services are within this. So except for one Wi-Fi port, there's nothing, there's nothing on the ceilings and the wall. It's absolutely clean and minimal, very monastic uh, in some ways. But when I go up, the building changes. It becomes lighter. You start seeing views. You see the trees. Uh, there's much more light. Uh, the terraces are accessible, uh, and uh, you know you can adjust the louvers depending on the uh, the time of the year, the season, etc. We also made a manual with what we think are the optimum uh, settings for every month in the semester, and this is in Gujarati and English, hoping that students might pick it up as a research project. Uh, and then, of course, at night it reverses uh, the transparency, exposes the inside much more, and the outside goes in profile. And you know, and these sort of, I, I've got only one person sitting there in this image, but this is people have lunch here, they work here, they have small meetings here. It becomes like an otla or a traditional plinth. And you look into the courtyard, so you see the life of the building inside, but you also are part of the life of the building uh, outside. And that, that's how you see, if you're sitting on this otla, that's what you see inside. Now I'll come to the last project and I'll end uh, guys just in 10 minutes. I'm sorry, I've probably taken more time than I should have taken. Uh, and this is a project uh, which is Hatigaon, which was alluded to. And this is well, this is the user, the clients in some ways, part of the clients, the mahout and the elephant. And you see the elephant doesn't look like he or she is in great shape. The years, the discoloring. You know, in, in Kerala, to have elephant orphanages on Sri Lanka, to have them is appropriate because these are tropical beings. But for them to be in the desert of Rajasthan in Jaipur was abnormal. Of course, they came with the Maharajas. They came as part of a whole kind of historical trajectory. Perpetuated, this is a page from the New York Times in the 60s, by tourism and how people, you know, went to enjoy this feeling of being a Maharaja for a day. Uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And they became a part of the service to the tourism industry. And what they did was take tourists up the forts of, Ram of Amber, hot, it gets 50 degrees centigrade. 
they paint their skins and that's why you have the discoloring they go rogue because the heat is so much and there have been incidents where tourists have been killed because the elephants have gone rogue so the chief minister of the state wanted to um, you know this is a long story and for whatever it's worth a group of young architects from jaipur have written a book on this which is going to be released i believe on the 16th of december in mumbai uh, it's a book where they've interviewed the mahuts the chief minister the bureaucrats the architects and kind of told the story about the project so after the 16 that will be a book that you might want to get because it's a very complex project i can't even get into it it spanned over 12 or 15 years uh, and it was really a competition that the chief minister initiated we won the first prize it was an invited competition the site we were given had been all quarried by sand contractors this is where the elephants lived <coughs> with the mahuts living above but the mahuts all moved down and started living here because they had to be close to the elephant this wasn't a sustainable model and so they found the site and we were asked to do the project we looked at metrics this was research linked to the project and we found that it was ridiculous for the number of amount of water that the elephant needed that we were going to have a project in the desert so we made water the chief protagonist which is to say that we said we've got to solve the problem of water everything comes second and i think we won the competition because of that because i know from the other entries uh, a couple of friends who had shared things with me you know they had studied the palaces of the maharajas and they found how the maharajas had kept it so it was very architecture centric these beautiful vaults and you know all of that which is another way of doing it but we felt that here life had to be privileged in a sense and so it became a kind of water project and we began to look at how we could create little micro dams how we could hold water how we could slow the flow of water how we could plant to stabilize the soil we looked at google images to see how the little streams of water you know jaipur gets like a few inches of rain in a year not not like all the wonderful rain you guys have and so how does one hold the water and create a logic and so therefore what we did was essentially mohan rao was our consultant from bangalore we designed the landscape first uh, and then place the buildings in the interstitial spaces not the other way around and so became the chief protagonist and from that evolved the site plan with a series of water bodies and 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 housing around clusters and that led to again this is a very complex story because there were political things there were things that stopped the project was abandoned for 3 years but in any case the end result was in 2007 when we first went to the site that's what we had and you see the same hill in this image 3 years later that's what we got and now 10 years later you know that's what you got and those are the same hills in the background so the landscape was completely transformed but we also focused on the housing the government gave us a brief to have row housing with the elephants living at the back we changed it to a cluster configuration so it it took the 300 square foot house or 450 square foot house uh, and made it bigger by adding a courtyard and then making the terrace accessible so people could build another room on the top there and so you got courtyards for every house you got three families and you got a big courtyard so the families got along well they had a mansion so we also played uh, paid a lot of emphasis on the architecture it's not that we didn't but we privileged the landscape because we knew in housing life corrodes architecture in rajasthan once they allocated the houses which has only happened a few months ago or maybe a year ago now i forget about the time we've lost in the pandemic that they've started decorating plastering changing at that point we said let the house just be a raw armature which is what you'll see in the images and now it's they are getting transformed but we felt the aggregation of the house the way it works on the site plan would be more important so we paid attention to the house how we could store the thatch on the top of the metal roof so that it would be insulated so it could take the hot air out we looked at all the good things but we didn't get, get overly anxious about it and that's what turned out and these are the roofs to store the food but they also insulate the houses it's kind of low cost because it's just basic so local stone with uh, just a very basic metal roof with the idea people would invest and everyone has a terrace so they could build things on the terrace the first water body that's ambed where they go to work so they walk all the way there to work which is pretty awful uh, and this is what the raw infrastructure looks like and you see we kept these windows so children could play because the mahut and the child and the family have a you know complex relationship with the elephant 
Uh, and of course, every cluster turned out to be different depending on who shared it. Some became lawns, some became, you know, just very stark. Uh, some became places people were growing and selling flowers. Now, this image, I just want to contemplate for a second. Again, somebody pointed this out. They said that, look, wow, there are lawns here, there are flowers here. People have more water than they need. So here are the poorest in society. These guys earn about 5,000, 6,000 rupees a month. And they look after the elephant and families. And what is amazing is by default, again, nothing we said we are going to do, but now when we create feedbacks and we think about it, by privileging water, by privileging and making this a project where it's an armature for life, meaning for life to thrive in a sense, one by default reversed an inequity, no? because now the poorest in the society of Jaipur have more water than they need that they can grow flowers and they can have lawns, which is the aspiration of every upper middle class person in that society. And the rich have to buy tankers of water because Jaipur has a water shortage. So this kind of reversals happen through spatial imaginations, right? It's just that we have to become more conscious about it. We have to articulate these lessons. And that's why I'm very happy that um, this group of young architects and photographers in Jaipur are writing this book because these are good things to capture. Uh, you know, if you go there, it's not the most beautiful architectural project, but you can tell that life is thriving. And, uh, we have to find ways to create the theoretical frameworks by which we can look at these kinds of things. Like many things come out of this. For example, what you can do at the middle scale, we often ignore the middle scale. We work at the small scale of the building and the house, and then we work at regional plans. The middle scale is where we can affect change in society the most. And this group of architects who's writing the book actually have contemplated this idea. What are the lessons that we can get from a project like this for the middle scale? And life corrodes architecture. Here, the kitchen now, they've moved to the courtyard, so they get an additional room. The goats have arrived. The trees are starting to grow. Uh, some clusters, people got get on much better with each other. Uh, you know, So they maintain the garden lawn. These houses haven't been painted or plastered because they hadn't been allocated. Now they've been allocated, and it's beautiful. They're doing paintings on it, and they're plastering it. And, People are putting, you know, uh, thatch curtains uh, to close the pavilion, uh, etc. That's a before and after just to show you the transformation. The dish antennas have arrived. Another thing that happened by default uh, was the water. Uh, you know, the elephants, of course, have much better health now because they their skins and things which were discoloring have stopped. But this is what we realized. This is in summer when the water is absolutely at the lowest. But this process of the mahout and the elephant bathing is so important for their bonding. This the mahouts told us. We had no idea. We were doing the water because we wanted green, because we felt the elephants would uh, you know, thrive. But this process, the mahouts tell us that our relationship with the elephants is much better because you know, we bathe them and we spend time with them, et cetera. And these are all kikar trees. Um, you know, it's growing. And the last thing I want to share with you before I close the lecture, two quick points. One is, you know, the Mahouts told us, because we were in touch with the users also, they said, look, we need pavilions where the elephants can hang out together because they're social beings. There was no budget for it. It wasn't. So whatever wasted steel there was, pipes and things, we made these very light structures with thatch where these elephants could come and hang out. Um, and, you know, the teenage kids or the kids of the Mahouts who are now more savvy, on uh, social media, all have cell phones. They saw it as an opportunity and they started a company called Elephantistic. And they set up a way that they could advertise this and they could have tourists come and pay 200 rupees to feed the elephants, 500 rupees if you want to have a bath with the elephant, etc. And so this has become like an economy for them. Uh, and, you know, they make money from it. Again, an unintended consequence because I think we privilege the fact that Look, let's do whatever makes life thrive here. Let's not obsess too much about architecture per se. Uh, of course, what we did, we tried to do elegantly and all of that. This encouraged us a lot. And we went and met the chief minister and said, look, if something like this happens, then there is scope here to even have a little hotel. But don't call it a hotel. We just call it a scholar's residence, which means it's four rooms around a courtyard in a very simple way. And, you know, you charge people a bomb, they come, let the mahouts and their families run the center. 
let them look after it. Uh, let the money go to them. If there are people who want to study elephants, if they're botanists, if there are people who want to study the ecology, those should be the people who should be privileged, not just the general janta tourists. The chief minister bought the idea and uh, gave us a budget. And so it was like a self-initiated project, which came out of our understanding of the needs of the mahouts and the users. Uh, and also what the operational client could do or not want to do. I've not spoken very much about it, but that's a tough group to deal with the public works department. Uh, and But we had access to the chief minister because we had won the competition. So we were making connections, trying to make this a better place. And this is what that guest house turned out to be. It's just a wall courtyard uh, with uh, four rooms, with literally with these sorts of beds, katyas, a balcony or a veranda. Uh, which is just slabs of stone. This is a column made out of solid stone and pergolas and bamboo from where you see the site and uh, the people can kind of enjoy being there without obstructing. The wives of the Mahouts cook and clean the place and run it. Of course, here politics is very important. And when the chief minister gets changed, the next chief minister stops it. So this has now been closed for many years. Uh, I don't know, maybe another chief minister will open it again. And this is what we mapped. And what you see here is very interesting, which is what is in red is RMA architects. And you see, we become a blur for a few years. Uh, what is in, uh, in orange and uh, green is BJP government, Congress government, BJP government, now Congress again. I haven't mapped it. This is an old map. Yeah. And what you see in between are the operational clients, which is the first it was Public Works Department, then it was Umber Development Authority, then it was Forest and Zoo, then it was Nobody. Now it's seven departments that have been appointed to look after it. And, and so actually the users, the Mahouts and the elephants and us, are the only constants in the project, right? And so our alliance became very important in terms of representing those aspirations to the patron clients, which is changing politicians. So one reason it's physically in bad shape when you go there is because every party that comes in ignores it, wants to close it down. Then the next party wants to actually invest in it. So maybe at some point in the future, it will settle. Uh, and you know, so this is a very detailed uh, mapping with the letters I was writing to the chief minister, to the public's work department, the decisions we were making, discussions with the Mahouts. So it's a it's an infographic which is in the Working in Mumbai book. If any of you are interesting, interested, a letter from the chief minister telling us to go ahead, the kinds of meetings we had, etc. But both the Hatiga book as well as Working in Mumbai has the details of this. And so here. The patrons, the clients, and the users got very differentiated, uh, and it became the architect's task to try to affect these transformations. So that was the first phase. The buildings got built, and the whole project got abandoned because the new government came. But because the water body was there, it allowed the trees to grow. Things started transforming. So when the next government came, we did some things. We added some pavilions. Then again, it fell. So then again, it stopped, etc. And so this became a kind of organic process. And at some point, we managed to put a darwaza, a small office for visitors and tourists who come who want to ask questions. At some points, we did infrastructure. At some points, that got closed. Uh, and this was a rendering we had done early of how we wanted to imagine it as a space that would have wetness in it. And this last image I'm going to show you, last two, this is an image that one of the Mahouts children sent me, uh, I think, six months ago, uh, just after the first rains. And you see the transformation that has occurred. The image I showed of the elephants being washed, where the stone is all visible, has all disappeared, and now the water is staying. And this is one of the most recent images uh, that we got of the place. So architecture is not important here. It changed the landscape for the use of people. Uh, for whom I think this was an important piece of infrastructure. And so really to go back to the beginning of your spheres of concern, your spheres of influence, how you blur binaries. I love this quote from the Polish chess master who says, tactics is knowing what to do when there's something to do, when someone gives you a brief, when only there's one agenda. Strategy is knowing what to do when there's nothing to do, which is why you making your agenda, you looking at the context of the context, you aspiring to blur the binaries that otherwise separate and polarize our world will make you useful agents uh, for the future. And I hope that's what you do going out. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mehotra, for the wonderful talk and such valuable insights on what, where, when, and how the idea of architecture can be. 
uh, we move on to a small interactive session from the avni community where we now engage with professor mehrotra uh, after his brilliant presentation in the form of questions and conversations now the best part about this is that half of the questions have already been answered in a wonderful presentation <laughs> <laughs> that all the students and the faculties had proposed so just <laughs> we have left i think two or three questions uh, which i will now uh, engage with uh, so we are starting with the first question which is from neha m uh, s1 student and advait vijay kumar uh, s1 student again so uh, they ask uh, and i quote in an earlier interview you had said urbanism is not about great vision it's about great adjustment can you elaborate on that while urban planning there might be conflicts between citizens stakeholders and engineers etc how do you resolve them so no that's a very very good question you know the my quotation in that interview about what i said in india or in the kinetic city uh, i think we shouldn't think about only grand vision which is how generally architecture urban design seems to be perpetuated right somebody had a vision and and then you have a kind of absolute solution for it right uh, but i think it's very important to look at grand adjustments seriously everything i was showing you in the kinetic city what can we learn from it right so let's put that on pause for a second and let's just transgress a little bit into two other notions since i've been thinking about which might help you uh, one is the idea of bringing the notion of time into planning and into architecture uh, and i'll elaborate that a little bit and the second is how do we move from thinking only in absolute terms to also thinking about transitions right and i think that might answer your question because even my own ideas since i gave that interview have evolved and again these are like literally lectures in themselves but i'll try to touch upon some of this so the notion of time uh why is permanent such an obsession with architects right um uh, and uh, and how do we think about time differently in this kind of uncertainty so let's just look at buildings first right what is when we talk about conservation uh we are basically talking about the life cycle of materials right and then when you look at um historic buildings and you find problems all the problems reside at the intersection of two materials of two different life cycles right so you have a stone wall that has a life cycle of 500 years and then you have a wooden beam that rests on the stone wall that has a life cycle of 100 years and all your problems are there then you're putting brackets and steel to support it and you're creating a a shoe for it and you're doing everything to make the life cycles of different components of a building compatible so can we keep this in mind can we design buildings where you separate the life cycle of materials that's what we did in the kmc building the facade has a life cycle which is different from the main building but the facade can be easily replaced without interfering with anything correct right? and so we can do this in many ways in the way the roof sits on a plinth and i mean we can imagine it in many ways but that becomes one imagination of time no in uh, in 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 buildings i mean i think in in a school like avni with everything you're doing uh you know a second year problem should not be designing a weekend home uh for a family the second year problem should be designing a weekend home for a family that in the brief tells you that in 18 years once our kids are 18 and 19 they're never going to come and spend a holiday with their parents so we want to be able to dismantle and recycle and upcycle the material in the house right that should be part of the brief then you're embedding time in your imagination right now let's extend that to city planning and to uh, urban design right why in cities do we lock land use for perpetuity right we should be having a category of land use which is this land use is for 10 years that is for 20 years that is for 30 years and of course there could be something that are more permanent i'm not arguing to make our cities all uncertain and in flux but i'm saying we have to infect the discourse with time to think that we don't so the the provocation for me for you would be are we making permanent solutions for temporary problems and therefore when uncertainty and flux comes there we have to be able to discern what time frame certain problems might be solved in we might not always be right but we have to embed that imagination now that is linked to the notion of 
transitions versus absolutes, which is to say that, you know, we often think in terms of end state planning. This is what we want to achieve, right? Uh, or we think in terms of absolute solutions. So for me, uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, the, I, I think, let me say, however noble the Swachh Bharat and all of that is the aspiration that we are going to have a toilet for every human being in the country or every family in the country is an absolute solution. So what is happening is millions of toilets are made in a prefabricating plant in some factory. They put in trucks and they put outside people's homes and villages. And the research has shown some work, uh, some don't work, some are the most pakka thing in the, in the whole village. So they use it to store grain, to store jewelry because it's like a big cupboard you know so it's that's an absolute solution because sanitation practice context matters culture matters uh, the form of the settlement matters so you can't put one toilet for everyone in a slum in mumbai no there's no place where will you take the connections what will you do so therefore community toilets become a transition in con in, in transforming that culture of sanitation and giving access to people. Now, then, th then it becomes a design question because it becomes a transitionary question. How do you design a community toilet that is used? How do you embed it in a Trojan ho horse of sanitation, which is that book I showed you, which is a new book that we are doing for our studio, where we're calling it sanitation as infrastructure. We are calling these as sanitation hubs, where you design a thing which has a public health component. It even has a little shop in it to sell amenities like a little pharmacy. It also has community toilets. It also recycles and sells water that is hygienic. How, how through design then do you make the transition? Because otherwise community toilets also have a stigma. Uh, because if by design, you know, I mean, like, look at the so Solab Sochalayas all over Mumbai. Those have become the new landmarks in Mumbai. I mean, you tell people, I'll meet you in front of the Solab Sochalaya because that's the most prominent landmark. Now, should a community toilet be designed like that? Absolutely not. It must be embedded in the lives of people, in their needs. So then it becomes a challenge for us as architects. That's a transitionary solution. The classic transitionary solution is India's energy policy. You know, uh, under Manmohan Singh as our prime minister and George Bush in America, India and America signed a treaty to go nuclear. Why did we go nuclear? We went nuclear because if we had to make a jump from fossil fuels uh, to uh, renewables, our economy would collapse. You can't do it so quickly. Even China is struggling, correct? So what we did was we made a transition through nuclear. Now it has its problems. You might get stuck in nuclear. We might never make the transition, but this is a new imagination and transitionary solutions are not linear. They are complicated. They take you through complicated paths. And that's where the material life cycle of buildings, that's where embodied energy, that's where reversibility, that's where the notion of the ephemeral, et cetera, can come because to make the transitional transitionary solutions, you don't want to leave a permanent mark. You want things that could disappear and be recycled because you're not sure where you're going, you're searching. And the design of the search, the design of how we make transitions is I think something we must embed in our pedagogy and thinking uh, as architects. And so that's what I mean by giving equal importance to grand vision, but also equal importance to grand adjustments. It's not one or the other. It's how do we complicate our lives by bringing both those into an intersection? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mehrotra, for the answer. It actually, I think uh, also makes sense that we indeed look at the larger picture and parallelly zoom in and zoom out at what urbanism can be. Uh, not great vision, like you said, the Solab Sochale just cannot be a landmark. And when people start associating it with that idea, there is a problem. And we need to sort of, like you said, embed it into society and not uh, make it stand out. Uh, it's quite a long one, actually. So, uh, so it comes from Jishnu, uh, semester five student. Uh, with COVID-19 impacting economies, geographies, and built environments across the globe, what skills do you think architects now should be equipped with in case of another world change, world changing event? Uh, in the wake of such a pandemic, according to you, what attributes could be included, taken heed of, or be incorporated for better operation of ephemeral mega cities like the Kumbh? Continuing into that, I'd like to merge one more question into that. So there's a tremendous amount of floating population that goes on into tier one and tier two cities 
for better opportunities. Uh, already saturated in terms of ancillary facilities, infrastructure, and even more so dwelling. Could you comment on how the notion of impermanence and ephemerality help tackle this situation? Wow, that's a lot of lot of questions. So look, I, you know, for the pandemic thing, uh, I, I mean, I'll just say this, that don't forget 99% of the problems that we are now talking about post-pandemic and in pandemic existed before the pandemic, right? Whether there were questions of inequity, of justice, of inaccess to amenities and things like that. So don't let the pandemic unfocus you into another area. Uh, I mean, I think we just have to remind ourselves the problems are the same, right? Now, the pandemic put some things on hold. And what it tells me is that we should be doing two things that come to my mind right away as architects. One is spending much more time on housing uh, and having a big role to play in housing, uh, not assuming, uh, and this goes also to your tier two, tier one questions. If you look at just housing, one big problem is everything you see around you premises the fact and the stability of the nuclear family. Everything, what is the metric of housing today? One BHK, two BHK, three BHK, right? We haven't gone beyond that. It's just mind blowing. Every ad you see, everything assumes there's a nuclear family. The flux that we have, you know, we have about 200 million people in India that go back and forth, three months in the village, six months here, two months there, working, this, that. Our housing types have to be reimagined in community housing. We have to look at the YMCA model for inspiration, et cetera. So for the pandemic and learning from the pandemic, the one big urgency, and that's why you had that what we call a stupid term called reverse migration. How can you have reverse migration within a country? You just had people going back home to their villages. Uh, you know, my other you start qualifying them as migrants, then you get into a us and them situation. So that itself is fundamentally wrong. The problem why that happened was people didn't have the security of homes, right? And so if you have formations in our cities that allow this flux to be absorbed, that becomes a huge design challenge, right? So those are the ways that, and then of course, the social and uh, the infrastructure, and that's why sanitation is infrastructure, public health, all of that, we need to pay much more attention in embedding those within mainstream problems, you know? And I think we are equipped to do that. So that's what we are trying to do with the sanitation hub. We're trying to pose that as a counter argument to the community toilet, which has stigmas with it. But if the sanitation hub also, I mean, you know, a community toilet could be the best lab to test the health of a community. If you had volunteers who came to use the community toilet and gave you their samples every day or every week, you'll know what diseases are spreading in that community, for example, right? So we need to think like this programmatically, spatially, and all of that. And so I think my short answer to you for a wonderful question would be, don't let the pandemic take your eye off the ball, as they say in cricket, but go back to remind yourself the problems are the same. How can you actually innovate within those problems to also address the kinds of flux that the pandemic causes and the kinds of well-being of people you can provide by infrastructure and by the imagination of program uh, that could facilitate that? And I think we are very equipped to do that. Just in the example of the sanitation infrastructure I'm giving you, we can think of many other examples if you had a brainstorming session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Merotra, for the insightful answer. Uh, we move on now to the next and, uh, in the interest of time, the final question. Uh, so it comes from Aditya Anjit, uh, semester one student. Uh, continuing like in the thread of uh, adaptations and adjustment. So the question comes, in a democratic country like India, we often see several attempts at de demolition of built heritage in the name of renovation and redevelopment. Considering that, what are your opinions on the Central Vista project? Also, how do we generate awareness amongst the larger public sphere regarding the importance of conserving and restoring important heritage buildings? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, I mean, I think there are many questions embedded there. So, you know, I mean, I think if you just let's start with the Central Vista, because that is, seems to be central to everyone's mind. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think, uh, look, uh, I mean, there are two ways to look at the Central Vista project, right? One is power representation, which is, you know, as I've said in many interviews, 
uh, every emperor in Delhi makes a new Delhi. Uh, and so you could look at it as power representation. And, you know, that's one way of looking at it. And then, of course, what we have is the kind of logical conclusion. You can also look at it uh, one step down from that extreme view and say uh, that, you know, maybe it did uh, need a renovation. Maybe it did need the infrastructure, uh, you know, pedestrianization, whatever, whatever, whatever to improve it. Uh, and the facilities were, you know, run down. Maybe we need to make a modern India. Maybe this is the new way that society feels that's what needs to be done. If you, so those are two, I think, legitimate aspects. Now you can argue about power representation and are we a democracy? Is this the way to represent a democracy, etc.? That's a separate discussion, which I can get into, but you know what I mean. And the second one is you could say that, look, there, this is someone in power and a group in power and certain bureaucrats, and they feel this needs an upliftment. We are celebrating our 75th uh, you know, uh, uh, year of independence, and we must look spanking new. That's a legitimate um, aspiration, let's say, right? Then the question becomes, the interesting question for us is, is this the right timing to do that with the pandemic? And two, was the process correct for a democracy, right? So the timing of it is, of course, then that becomes a value-ridden question. Uh, because if I was in part, I would have used the money to do 100 hospitals. I think I would have got better goodwill. I could have advertised that for the world to say this is how India celebrates its 75th anniversary of independence, uh, et cetera, right? Of course, for us as civil society, that's a no-brainer. But then often politicians don't think like that, right? Uh, they, they have other ways of imagining what that would mean. But then I think that's where I think the role of the profession becomes important because can we have that influence? Can we have imaginations? Or do we just get co-opted by the powers? And this is why I say that you have to have your agenda because if you don't have your agenda, there's no resistance to the other agenda, right? And so that it is through those forms of healthy resistance. I don't mean resistance in terms of a, a revolt resistance, but resistance in a kind of intellectual way uh, that you lead to better solutions, right? And so I think one classic question to be asked for the Central Vista would be, was the timing right? I mean, is the 75 years, is the 75 years a sacred number for our democracy that we should be doing it? I mean, 100 would be even more sacred, 50 would be. Maybe for someone, 75 is maybe when you add seven and five, and you get 12, maybe that's some by Vastu or something, some sacred number. And it means, I don't know, there could be all sorts of explanation. Who cares? But the point is, what is the value? So what 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 it what the Central Vista is doing, unfor unfortunately or fortunately for us as a society, is representing our values. And that's what makes us all comfortable. Is that our value reside in that or would we have done something else, right? So this is a big question for any nation. Identity comes from it. Identity is not a found entity. Identity is a constructed value. Our identity comes from what we identify with, right? The world saw identity as frugality, nonviolence, uh, et cetera, when Gandhi was in leadership, right? Because that was the values we as a nation identified with. That's what got us our independence, right? Our values and what we are identifying now with is completely different. We are identifying with consumption. We are identifying with you know, capitalism. We are identifying with autocracy. We are identifying with all sorts of things. And so that's what our identity will come with. And it is the job of us as civil society to create the alter alternative narratives, right? So partly what happens there reflects all of us because we have not had the ability to come up with the alternative, right? The other question that I think it raises is uh, uh, democracy and what should be the form of democracy for projects like this? And I mean, if, if I was the advisor to the prime minister, I would have convinced them that uh, if they had the great faith in me, they would give me the project as they have to, you know, another architect. And I would, for example, say you, you, you separate urban design from the architecture, which means some group, a collaboration or an architect makes a framework, which is the urban design framework. And then you maybe invite one architect from every state to do the buildings along the Central Avenue, which could be competitions. It could be now that can't be done in 18 months. So that would not meet the deadline of the 75 year anniversary. And therefore, decisions are taken to the contrary. Right. So it's I think right now around the world, 
uh, there is a kind of movement that is occurring, which is that uh, there is a lack of faith in democratic processes because many of them haven't delivered what they should and they have perpetuated forms of inequity. And so there is also there is a move towards creating forms of autocracy that are promising to do that, which we clearly know from history is will not happen, which means then there'll be a swing back perhaps over time, which is what history seems to finally be a swing back and forth, unfortunately. Uh, and so I think, you know, you have to look at this project. So this is, again, the context is the Central Vista project, but the context of the context is all these things I'm talking about. And that's how you begin to then understand uh, what is, I think, happening around you. Was there, was there another question? I uh, yeah, actually, I think it was answered. The other part was, okay. how do we generate am awareness amongst the larger public sphere regarding the importance? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll tell you. That, that's very important. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say that, and then I have to log off because I have a class in nine minutes. Uh, so, uh, 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 so look here. I, I think this is a very, very important question. So, I think in in democracies, uh, uh, and I think that's why I kept using the word bridge. Uh, that we as professionals have to bridge different parts of society, right? And uh, what is happening, I think, in India, which I have the greatest hope in, and in my own experience in the last um, 20, 30 years I've been involved with, which I think is missing in projects like the Central Vista. They have now met with people and told them and presented them, but that's all nam vaste and symbolic and emblematic. That's got nothing to informing the project, right? It's uh, uh, So that's a problem. But I think India's hope, if it has to stay a democracy, which it will, is that we have to give greater... Uh, attention to civil society. What do I mean by civil society? Civil society is that part of society that bridges the grassroots with the more powerful, right? Uh, it is the part of society that has the empathy uh, for the marginalized, but it has the wherewithal to negotiate with more powerful forces, right? Foundations, NGOs, trade unions. Trade unions are part of civil society. Right. These are the critical bridges that we are going to have in our society. And we have to, as practitioners, align and reinforce and make instruments for advocacy for that part of society. That should be our constituency. If we start aligning with only the more powerful forces, which we can see, and that's why you result in projects like the ones that we are discussing, or you only empathize with the grassroots, you don't become the bridge then you live in that world of binaries. And I think civil society is a very important part that we must all, re and we are all part of civil society. We all have the blessing of education, which equips us to negotiate more powerful forces. And I hope our education, and I can see it in the words and in the thematics that your school is doing, sensitizes you for that empathy for the marginalized, right? Then it becomes your responsibility to bridge to be the bridge in society, to be part of civil society. And that's what I meant when I said, don't worry about doing everything, make the instruments, because if you make these counter imaginations, then you will have an alignment with civil society. And that has the motivation to make that change, right? So those are the partners we have to look. That will be our biggest clientele, I believe, if we have to make any substantial transformation in India, and especially in a democratic India. Uh, thank Done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Merotra. Uh, I'm, I'll not take much time. <laughs> I'll just quickly move on uh, towards the end. I I'd like to thank everyone for the wonderful questions and inquiries. And I'd like to extend my the best of heartfelt gratitude to Professor Merotra for being so kind and sharing valuable time with us and enlightening the entire Avni community with his insightful discussion. I'd now like to invite Dr. Somini to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, thank you. We wouldn't take much time. Uh, so it gives me immense pleasure to extend our sincere gratitude to you for this enlightening lecture. Uh, reading and listening to you has always encouraged newer perspectives and has often shaped one's critical engagement with the built environment. And I'm confident that the session has helped our students and faculty alike to reflect on their what you call architecture of practice. Uh, we really look forward to hosting you on campus real soon and for a probably a prolonged engagement with 
uh, our new community in building more robust uh, teaching and learning pedagogies. Uh, I, I really wish to extend an invitation to you to be part of our community. Uh, I also wish to take this opportunity to thank architect Tony Joseph and uh, our governing council for their constant support and encouragement and my colleagues and students for their rigorous engagement within the academy. Uh, special thanks to the curator, student volunteers, graphics team, admin, and IT team. Thank you so much for organizing this event. Uh, this, is all, this is also the concluding session for the full 10 days of Disha 2021 for our uh, 2021 batch of students. I hope all first year students have gained immensely from the immediate lectures and workshops that were hosted as part of the induction program. So thank you all for your participation and I wish you all a very good evening ahead and a good day to you, Rahul. We really look forward to having you here soon. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.